All right, everybody, let's get started. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Lunchtime Discovery Series. I am your host. My name is Chris Smith. You can find me here on the museum's YouTube channel every Wednesday at noon, bringing you a fun, exciting, informative, and insightful program. Uh, this show every week is brought to you by the Office of Environmental Education within the Department of Environmental Quality. So many thanks to the folks within the EE office for helping put together a great show every single week. They find the best people, insightful, smart, passionate people to give us their knowledge and expertise on science, nature, environmental education. We cover all kinds of topics. And uh, today is gonna be no different, of course. And many thanks to the folks at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences as well, who helped put on the show. That includes the digital media staff behind the scenes and you know everybody else. We have a great team. We all work together in state government to bring you what is a very popular, very cool show. So glad that you could be here. I'll remind everybody that as we go throughout the talk, you can leave questions, comments, thoughts in the chat box here on YouTube. I think it's on that side from where I'm at. And uh, you can also tweet at the Office of Environmental Education. They're at North Carolina EE, or you can just use the hashtag lunchtime discovery to share your expertise and your thoughts as well as we go through the program. I've got all that pulled up here so that I can see what the conversations are happening online for today's presentation. Now, for today, we've got like the best. We've got an amazing, show because we have somebody who's been on the TED stage. We have scientist, TED speaker, and the president of the Microbe Institute, Dr. Ann Madden. Dr. Madden, welcome to the show. Hi there. Thank you so much for having me. Glad you could be with us. Uh, how are things in wherever you are quarantining, perhaps? I'm in Boston and uh, spending a lot of time making sourdough. Still, still on the sourdough kick, huh? Always. Come on, it's a way of appreciating microbes nearest us. Now, oh, well, now this is very true. Now, were you a big sourdough fan before or just more, a sourdough microbe fan? More a fan of eating it before. Now I fully appreciate the process of making it. It makes a lot of sense that somebody who spent a lot of time around microbes would appreciate sourdough even more than the average person like me, perhaps. I think that regardless of your background in microbiology or chemistry, I think we can all appreciate that wonderful texture of a nice toasted piece of sourdough. And knowing about the microbes is just an added benefit. <laughs> well, that, that all sounds great and good. Uh, tell you what, let's get started. I'll turn it over to you. Sounds good. This is the fun part. I need hold music that plays during the screen share portion of each program. We're doing virtual programs three or four times a week out of the museum. And then there's always that five second gap. I need something to cover it. Should create our own theme music. Do, do, do. There we All go. All right. Looks good. Well, thank you so much. Today, we're gonna to talk a little bit about exploring the biological cosmos. Now you all very well might be watching this presentation from your home uh, and that's not because the home is the most fun place to watch talks, but because a microbe has compromised your freedom. It has dictated your behaviors. And in 2020, more than ever, we're all too aware of the problems that microbes cause. They can cause the mundane problems. They mildew our home. They can rot our food. They create body odors and the smells we associate with sewage, things that are rancid, rotting, putrid, fecal. They also cause cat catastrophic problems. They transform our romaine lettuce into things that attack us. They uh, cause infections and pain. They produce toxins that cause cancer and infections that cause so, so much death. Indeed, a microbe has trapped us at home, and it is a powerful microbe that makes our world feel scary, dangerous, and small. 
but I believe microbes hold an additional secret power that by learning more about them and the microbes that are nearest us, it can actually make our world feel larger, safer, and more full of hope. And hopefully you'll feel the same way by the end of this talk. So in the last 15 years of my own life, I've spent a long time conducting research on the microbial communities nearest us, whether they're hands or crops, dirt, soil, lichens, even insects. And more than just exploring these species, I'm interested in understanding how they can help make our lives better. So in industry and academia, I've researched and developed microbial technology for the fields of agriculture, pharmaceuticals, and food and beverage. Along the way, I've gotten to name new species, discover novel antibiotics, and develop patent pending brewing technology. I also spend quite a bit of time doing science communication and talking about the microbial world in different spaces, such as a 2017 main stage TED talk where my co-speakers this week were Elon Musk, Serena Williams, and the Pope. For the record, I've worked with causative agents of anthrax and the plague, and giving public talks is far, far more terrifying. So don't be mistaken by the smile. But pursuing research and communication work such as this was the last thing that I could imagine doing about 15 years ago when I was a junior in college. At that point, I didn't care much about microbes. I cared about animals. From manatees to sheep to dogs and cats, I loved them all. And so as an undergraduate, I was planning on becoming a vet until one day my life changed forever. Summer of my junior year, I had the chance to be a field research assistant in Costa Rica. And that's where I saw animals I could have never imagined. I was working with researchers catching poison dart frogs, catching snakes, and measuring light in the canopy. And all around me were these remarkable species, species I'd never dreamed of, species I'd only seen in nature documentaries, monkeys, sloths, ocelots, tapirs, I fell in love with research and this process of discovery. But then I came back to college in New England and everything around me felt gray and plain. There were no snakes, no charismatic frogs. There was also no tropical biology lab. So instead, I started doing research in a microbiology lab, looking at the microbes in soil. I replaced my binoculars with microscopes, my snake bags, with test tube vials. And I started to explore the creatures in soil. And in these Petri dishes, I started to learn about the microscopic creatures that were all around us. These single-celled organisms like bacteria and fungi. I learned about their colors and their smells and how if you poked some of them, they were rubbery in texture, others felt like shampoo. How the white one here in the center of the image smells like the caves where you can find the cheese that this microbe came from. And how the orange microbe in the corner smells like feet, while the yellow microbe smells like Jolly Rancher candy. And in learning about these creatures, I realized that I didn't have to travel to the rainforest to find new species that were mysterious. Rather, I could look all around me. I was living in a jungle at a different scale. This is the biological cosmos. And today, I wanna to take you for a little walk through the biological cosmos nearest you by going on a virtual walk around our backyard and home and meeting some of the microbes along the way that make our lives better. Hopefully by the end of this, you will learn about a few of the microbial applications that affect your life. And because we've all been spending so much time in front of screens, I thought this would be a good opportunity to start using our senses to really delve into the different ways we can find these microbes nearest us. I'm gonna keep the technical details really, really light, but I can go into them more in the Q&A. But before we explore the rest of the biological cosmos, we have to think about the microbial scale of life. 
microbes are so small, it's hard for us to conceptualize them. To make this more tangible, I've employed the use of fashion and 3D printing. So if we were to travel down the microscope, hurtling through space, to get to the point where a coronavirus particle was big enough to fit in our hands, then a bacterial cell, like those you might find in uh, something like yogurt, be about the size of a large hat. Wearing this hat, it would take us about seven human steps to traverse the size of one human cheek cell. The smallest bits of us are big when compared to the microbial world. Because they're so small and they have spent so long evolving on this planet, they have a diversified in terms of number of species. It's also hard to conceptualize this. And so let's take a moment and think about all of the animal and plant species on earth. You think about giraffes and every animal and plant that you saw in those tropical biology photos, every pine tree and sunflower. If, this, if it took us a second to count each one of those species, it would take us about three months to count all the species of animals and plants on this earth, all the animals and plants on this earth. Now, if we wanted to count all the species of microbes that also exist on this planet, it would take us about 30,000 years. That's longer than human civilization has been around. Most of the species on earth can't be seen with the naked eye. Most of life is invisible. What does this mean for you and me? It means that if we go outside and grab a sugar packet's worth of soil from any bit of dirt, there are more than 20,000 species of bacteria in that soil. This is more species than there are animal species in all the zoos in the world. Go a step further, find another sugar packet's worth of dirt, and you've got a whole new planet's worth of species. Because of this diversity, there are microbial species that live anywhere on this earth and can do anything. There are microbes that live in nuclear reactors and can feed off radiation. Others live in the deep sea and feed off of sea smoke. Some produce waste products like alcohol. Others produce nuggets of gold. Some live in boiling water. Others live in the Arctic. Truly, they are microbial alchemists evolving diverse ways of transforming matter, helping them survive. So let's meet some of them nearest to us. Uh, for the rest of this presentation, this will be our shared virtual backyard. And we're gonna take a walk through some of the places. So we're gonna stop uh, first at a compost heap. If you have a yard with compost, this will be familiar to you. So if you have compost, you know that if you take a scoop of it or dig your hands into it, it feels warm, even hot. And this is a video showing just how hot that compost can be. You can see the steam coming off of it. Compost can reach temperatures of 65 degrees Celsius or about 149 degrees Fahrenheit. So that heat that you're feeling is actually coming from microbes that are decomposing plant material. They're creating heat as a byproduct of their metabolism as they break down plant material into the sugars and proteins for their own growth. Now, there are many bacteria and fungi in compost in terms of species, but some of the dominant species are bacillus, and, and as the temperature gets warmer, thermos. Now, we rely on these microbes to help us recycle nutrients and break down plant material. Uh, these are the microbes that are called decomposers that we often learn about in high school. Uh, and we don't tend to think about much in life. But what I love about them is that other animals have figured, a way of use, figured out a way of using these decomposers in a much more ingenious way. And that's why I want to tell you the brief story of the Australian brush turkey. Australian brush turkeys are ground nesting birds that live in Australia. And they build these nests of compost decaying plant material. And the nest can be as big as a car measuring a few feet across. 
these birds are actually even considered a pest in Australia because they will steal compost, compost and valuable mulch from neighborhoods. Now these birds are not particularly interested in microbes that can recycle nutrients. Instead, they're on the hunt for babysitters. These birds bury their eggs in compost and they rely on the heat generated from microbes to help incubate those eggs. This heat allows them to incubate 20 times more eggs than if they didn't have a compost nest. Turns out these compost microbes make really good babysitters. So the next time that you look at your compost heap in your backyard and dig your hands into it and feel that warmth, you can know that there are bacillus and thermos species helping recycle nutrients. And somewhere in Australia, they're also helping incubate brush turkey eggs. So let's go back to our backyard. And we're gonna take a few steps over to a patch of clover. And there we can find another microbial partnership, but one that's not between birds and microbes, but plants and microbes. So clover are those three and four leaf plants that you can find, you can see in this video, I went on a walk and found them nearest me. And if you dig them up like I did, you can start to see these little pink nodules on their roots. And I'm squishing it here to reveal more of the color, which really just looks like the same color as my fingertips. And so in these pink nodules are bacteria, rhizobia bacteria. And if we were to look closer at these nodules under a microscope, we can see that in each one of these plant cells, there's housed hundreds and hundreds of rhizobia bacteria that are stained lavender. So the reason that the plant partners with these microbes is not just to produce aesthetically pleasing pink nodules, but rather the, because the microbes can do something that the clover cannot. They can access nitrogen in the air we breathe and convert it into a form of nitrogen used for building proteins. It's almost as if we were to take a breath of air and convert it into a protein bar. Um, and this is my slightly clumsy way of describing nitrogen fixation. So these bacteria end up fertilizing the plant uh, and in return, they get fed sugars from the plant uh, and in a nice home to live in. So this partnership between rhizobia bacteria and clover is not unique. Yeah. Rhizobia bacteria are used by many different legumes or bean-like plants. And um, other bean plants you might be used to include soybeans. So soybeans are used for animal feed. They're also used to make soy sauce and miso or tofu. And rhizobia are so good at fertilizing plants that many farmers in Brazil and some farmers in the US actually plant their soybeans along with rhizobia bacteria to help those plants increase yield. Now, if you get the opportunity after this talk, I recommend downloading the free Community of Microbes app to learn more about this microbe and others. And this is a fun app that a team of us developed and we had animations of microbes. And so here you can see this layer of augmented reality technology where you can interact with these images and in this case, see the pink nodules forming. If you were to then scroll up, you could learn more about rhizobium bacteria. So the next time you're in your yard and walking over your clover, you can think about those pink nodules just under the ground and how they're housing rhizobia bacteria that are helping soybean farmers feed us. So while we have those plants ripped up, <laughs> let's take a look at that soil. Um, and perhaps if you're not outside and you still wanna go on this microbial adventure, then you can do the same thing with a potted plant and the soil that's in there. Yeah. And that's what I did the other day when I made these authentic, if not high quality videos. So if you take this handful of dirt you get that smell of fresh turned earth. Um, it's one of my favorite smells in the world. And that's the smell of jasmine, a chemical that's found throughout soil. Well, that jasmine smell 
is actually produced by a group of bacteria called actinobacteria. Now, when you grow actinobacteria out in the lab, as I used to, the whole lab will start to smell like fresh turned soil in a pasture. Um, these are one of my favorite groups of bacteria. I think they look like tiny little sheep because they make these fluff balls of cells when you grow them on petri plates. So these soil microbes are much like compost microbes feeding on decaying plant material. Uh, in fact, there are a lot of microbes in the soil that are also competing for this wonderful, valuable, yummy plant material. Actinobacteria can't protect these resources by flying away with them like a falcon would or by protecting them with claws or fangs as other animals would. So instead, these species have developed chemical weapons to protect themselves and protect their resources from other competing bacteria. Well, this is useful to us because this chemical weaponry are actually antibiotics. And it is these soil bacteria, these actinobacteria, where we get most of the antibiotics that we use every day. If you've ever taken tetracycline, phosphomycin for a UTI, or one of a slew of antibiotics, it likely came from these bacteria that live in our soil. In 2020, I think it's hard to think about how important these bacteria are and the discovery of antibiotics were. But prior to the discovery of antibiotics, it wasn't cancer killing most people, it was microbial infections. And so thanks to these soil bacteria and the chemical weapons they produce, we now don't fear bacterial infections the way we used to. So the next time you're hanging out in your yard and sniffing some dirt, you can think about those sheep-like bacteria that are helping produce antibiotics and keeping us safe. All right, we could stay in the soil and talk about other microbes, but I think it might be more fun to visit the house dust where some of our soil microbes end up. And so for this next example, we're going to take a jaunt over to our house dust and look what's in there. So if you're sweeping up your home, you're likely also sweeping up a group of fungi called aspergillus. Now there's no real sensory way you can detect aspergillus, not through smell or touch, but you can just know that along with the cat fur and other dust particulate, aspergillus fungi are there. And if you grow them on petri plates, they kind of look like this. And you know them perhaps because they often trigger our indoor allergies. Sometimes they're busy rotting parts of our homes. So we don't typically love having aspergillus near us. And that's kind of too bad because they're really beautiful. They create these adorable pom-pom-like structures on Petri plates. And it turns out in the 70s and 80s, someone saw these fungi and thought that they might be able to do more than just make our house dirty. And that's when a group found that this particular species of aspergillus, this beautiful pink one, aspergillus terius, could produce another powerful compound, not an antibiotic, but a compound that could actually interfere, interfere with cholesterol synthesis in humans. I won't get into the technical details of this compound, but it is the origin of statins. Statins are cholesterol lowering medications and Many of the people in our lives are taking these medications to avoid heart attacks. Statins are also important in terms of their value to humans because of the financial value. So the discovery of statins is thought to be about a $131 billion discovery. And I think about that whenever I'm sweeping up dirt in my house and thinking about what other microbial application is waiting to be discovered in that dust that might also be so useful as to save lives and to generate that much income. So again, afterwards, if you download the community of microbes application, you can play around and see more information about aspergillus. And here you can see the animation where it's growing and this is how it grows and produces spores or seed-like bits of cells that float around. 
All right, so now you're in your house dust, you're thinking about how wonderfully valuable these creatures are that we can't see. But let's head back out to the garden. And there you might have a pandemic garden that includes a cabbage. And if you're particularly unlucky, your cabbage might have this kind of yellowing lesions that are V-shaped. Um, these are a sign of black rot. And so this isn't really good news for your cabbage, but it is interesting for other parts of your life. So the yellowing cabbage is caused by a microbe called Xanthomonas. And you can see in this image, the Xanthomonas bacteria are little sausage shaped creatures and they're entering the cabbage through small pores. And once they enter the cabbage, they replicate and replicate and start producing this goo. And this goo starts choking the cabbage from the inside out. And so in the top here, you can see these yellow Xanthomonas microbes and that goo that it produces, which is a polysaccharide. So this is a terrible problem for a lot of people trying to grow cabbage. But where some people see problems, other people see solutions. And that was the case in the 50s when a scientist named Aline Rosalind Jeans noticed how much goo or polysaccharide was being produced by these microbes. She also knew that goo-like material was really useful in the food, cosmetic, and even pharmaceutical industry where we're typically looking for kind of creamy textures or where we want things to be pastes instead of liquid. And she found that if you separated out the microbes from this polysaccharide, xanthan gum, you could use that xanthan gum for other things. And so now you can end up buying xanthan gum because it is one of the most mass produced uh, polysaccharides of all times. And here you can see this vegan snot, which is what happens when you add xanthan gum to water. So that's all the goo. There are no microbes in there. This goo you'll see a lot in your life if you start looking at the ingredient lists of different things. So I went into my cupboards and I looked at uh, hot sauces and salad dressings and uh, toothpastes. And it is involved in making all of those things creamy and gooey. So skipping ahead, we're going to say that if you're looking at that cabbage and noticing that lesions, then I'm sorry for you for having that rot problem. But you can also take heed in knowing that that same microbe that's causing a problem is maybe helping your ice cream be creamier later. OK, well, we have spent some time in the garden. Someone else has been busy baking inside. So we see sourdough resting by the window. Now, if you have made sourdough, like I have during the pandemic, you know that it doesn't require commercial yeast. Rather, you add water to flour, and over time, it will start bubbling. And that that is a starter that you can use to bake with. And so my colleague, Erin McKenney at North Carolina State University, created this beautiful video of a time lapse of a starter doing that, just that, starting to show that activity. You've got the flour and water, and these bubbles are all coming from natural microbes or microbes that were in that flour water mixture. See it bubbling away. So the microbes in your starter are producing those bubbles that will help leaven the bread. And they're also producing the smell and taste of that sourdough. So those sour notes are all coming from microbes. Now, if you grow out the microbes in your sourdough, uh, like I did a few weeks ago, this is kind of what you'll see on a Petri plate, all sorts of different creatures growing. There are a lot of different species of microbes within sourdough, but there are three groups. So the first one are yeast, and they're the ones that are producing that carbon dioxide. You know yeast because they're similar to the commercial yeast we use to bake bread with. But what separates bread, sourdough, from white bread are those tart notes, and those are, com are coming from the bacteria. And there are two groups of bacteria. There's the lactic acid bacteria, 
and the acetic acid bacteria. Both are producing acids that help fend off other microbes that may rot that starter. The lactic acid bacteria are producing the lactic acid. You'll note that in the tartness that you get in your mouth, uh, that you sense in your mouth. And then the acetic acid bacteria are producing the sourness that you, you smell. It's kind of like vinegar. Um, you might know acetic acid bacteria if you are making kombucha, very similar bacterial groups. So we've been making sourdough for at least 12,000 years as a society, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't still have secrets in it. And so if you would like to learn how to capture your own wild yeast and actually help us as scientists learn about what species and what's going on in that microbial community, then head on over to the Wild Sourdough Project. You can also, again, visit the app and learn more about the yeast that are in sourdough and how yeast are in our lives. Um, and you can see them here budding off of one another. This is how the yeast replicate. All right, so the next time you have a nice chewy bite of sourdough bread, you can thank the microbes that helped make those wonderful flavors for you. Now, I know it's lunchtime and we've managed to talk a lot about the xanthan gum that might be making ice cream creamier. And we've talked about bread, how some of those flavors come from microbes. And so I wanted to close out this section of the talk by giving the example that is my favorite when it comes to microbes and flavors. And to do this, we're gonna to go to the unlikely place of a paper wasp nest. So paper wasps and hornets can be found making papery nests on most houses this time of year. Um, they can also be found visiting picnics or fruits because they're particularly motivated to find sugar. And that's what these wasps are doing when they eat this grape. But they don't just visit fruit. They can be found wherever you find large amounts of sugar in the world. So that'll be on tree sap or flower nectar or fruits but they're not the only creatures with sweet tooths. If you were to look at the microscopic level, you'd see yeasts, just like the yeast that we met in sourdough, also living in these sugary environments. But the problem for yeasts is that these sources of sugar are ephemeral. And unlike wasps, they're not very good at moving themselves around the environment. The distance between a tree and a fruit is astronomical when you're a yeast cell. And so they rely on insects like wasps, to act as giant airplanes for them, bringing them from one ephemeral sugar source to another. This means that if you look inside the body of a wasp and start growing the microbes inside them, you find many, many, many species of microbes, including many species of yeasts. And so I'm about to talk about why these yeasts are so exciting, but I wanna preface this by saying, I do not recommend growing yeast from wasps and insects at home because some of these yeasts are dangerous and some of them can produce byproducts that are not safe. That being said, some of these yeasts are the ones that we know of when we're making bread or making beer. They're the same yeasts that have been helping us make wine for years. So some of them are particularly well understood, but a few of these yeasts have a number of secrets. And that's the case with one yeast in particular that we found a few years ago. In 2013, working with colleagues at North Carolina State University, I found a yeast inside a wasp that is quite unrelated to standard brewing yeast. It's a species of Lachancia yeast. And this is what it looks like under the microscope. Pretty boring, if you ask me. But in the 150 years or so since it's diverged from brewing yeast, it's learned a couple of new tricks. And to describe why those skill sets are unique, we have to take a step back and learn about how beer is conventionally made. So for reference, conventional beer is made with brewer's yeast, typically species of Saccharomyces. You add in some hops, bittering agent, grains and water, and a few weeks later, you have beer. 
if you are a fan of sour beer, which is beer that has those tart notes, it's made by a slightly different method. It involves that same brewer's yeast, sometimes hops, grains, water, but then there are other microbes that are typically added to the process to make those tart notes. These are some of the same bacteria that make sourdough tart, those acetic and lactic acid bacteria. This whole process is um, harder for brewers because it often leads to batch to batch variation, takes more time, typically more resources. And that's where this new Lachancia yeast comes in. It has the ability to make a conventional beer in terms of taking about two weeks, makes a beer of about 8% if needed, 8% alcohol that is, but it can do something remarkable. It can produce sour notes. So this new yeast is acting like this whole community of microbes producing tartness and all of those sour notes, some fruity aromas, but without the need for other microbes. In the brewing world, this was somewhat remarkable because it was one of the first cases of monoculture sour beer brewing. And it came from this yeast inside a wasp. And so working with colleagues at North Carolina State University, we created the company Lachancia, which is a North Carolina based company, which allowed us to distribute these yeast to brewers around the world. And they started using this yeast to make sour beers in a whole new way. And since then, they've been helping brewers make award-winning beer, cider, and sake. And all of this came from new yeasts that were located in wasps on the side of homes. And so when you next see a paper wasp, you can think of how it's helping making new beer flavors, how it's keeping beer yeast safe. And you can finally answer the question of what good is a wasp? So in our virtual walk today, we've gone in a number of places and met a number of microbes. We went into compost and met the microbes that are recycling nutrients and helping brush turkeys in Australia incubate eggs. We met the microbes in clover that are helping fertilize plants and helping farmers produce soybeans. We met the microbes in soil that are producing our antibiotics, so adorable little sheep microbes. And then we went into house dust and found the microbes that are making statins, valuable medications. We visited our pandemic garden and saw the microbes that cause plant disease, but also make this wonderful food additive, xanthan gum. And then we sampled our sourdough to meet some of the microbes that are helping us bake bread. Finally, we met the wasps that are helping us bring new beer flavors of the future to market. These are just a few of the microbes that live nearest to us. In fact, it's estimated that 90% of the microbes around us are unknown, unnamed, and undiscovered. So just imagine what all these microbial species around us might be capable of doing. They might be capable of creating new solutions to our plastic problems. They might be capable of producing new medications that can save future lives. And they might be capable of producing our new favorite flavor. So the next time you're feeling trapped at home and like every microbe in the world is up to no good, I want you to remember that you are living in a vast biological cosmos of microbes many of which are working hard behind the scenes to make our lives more sustainable, healthier, and enjoyable. And hopefully that makes your world feel a little bit bigger, brighter, and more full of hope. Huge amount of thanks to all the research teams that generated the data that I sort of gave a superficial pass at. Uh, I want to especially highlight the work of Betsy Dexter Dyer in her A Field Guide to Bacteria. I suggest reading it if you'd like to learn more about the microbes nearest to you. And I will, with that, I will turn it over to Chris. Dr. Madden, thank you so much. Thank Excellent you. Stuff. How cool.
I mean, you know, working in a science museum, you, you get to learn a thing or two about the diversity of life on earth. That's kind of what we do in a natural history museum, right? Uh, and we're fortunate at the Museum of Natural Sciences, we have a genomics and a microbiology lab that's on display. And I think some of the folks from the lab are actually tuned in and watching the program today. So if you are, hi, Julie, hi, Don. Uh, but it still astounds me every time I hear about it, the sheer diversity of microbes. Like it, it's one thing, like, you know it, you know there's lots of microbes and the microbes are everywhere, but to actually get the kind of perspective uh, that you've placed on it here still blows my mind. I think that's what's so beautiful about the microbial world is that we think of them as the smallest creatures on earth that are perhaps the most uniform. We say, oh, they're all germs or they're all mildew when really they're the most diverse groups we could imagine. And so anything that we've seen with our eyes during our entire lifetimes are just the fingertips of the biological tree of diversity. Uh, and I love that idea that all of the remarkable species that I've seen and gotten to know in my life are just a fraction of what exists. So I'm gonna drop us out of screen share for a moment and we'll take a few questions. So I'll remind everybody, if you have some questions, thoughts, drop them in the chat box. I've got those here and I'll be grabbing those and we'll pose those back to today's guest. Uh, but I'll throw the first question out there, I guess, which is what is the current state? What's our understanding like of how microbes can be used for human uses? Like it seems like we've just like you went into such great detail We've turned lots of microbes into things that we need or want for, for human benefit. Is that, and we've heard a lot about, you know, we need to keep doing more research and discovery because there could be so many more out there. Um, but what is the current state of that? Like, are we pushing ahead in micro research at the rate that we need to, to make the discoveries that can make our lives better. There, I got it out one way or another. I think that's a great question. So our rate of discovery of new fantastic applications is only limited by our own interest. There still is a wall of unknown species that haven't yet been discovered. And with each one of those species, there's likely to be a new useful application. That being said, there are microbial applications discovered and used every day, and they're often as cryptic as the ones that I mentioned, um, but the list kind of goes on. So if we sort of take a, a moment in your morning, uh, your coffee was made possible by microbes that fermented the coffee beans. Um, your clothing right now, if you're wearing cotton, those were produced by microbial enzymes. Uh, the coronavirus vaccines that we're all looking forward to, some of them likely are made possible by other microbes that are genetically modified adenoviruses. These are microbes in our environment that will actually help save us from this one microbe that's causing so much pain. So I, I wanna answer your, your question in both ways. There are remarkable applications being discovered and developed every single day that often microbes are not given the credit for but we have so many more microbes to discover. Excellent, thank you. All right, Marty wants to know, in your opinion, what is the most exciting, new or promising technology based on microbial research? Ooh, it's a great question. And I think it's one of those choose your favorite pet or favorite child questions, <laughs> but let me take a stab at it. Um, we're gonna go with a few days ago, there was actually a news headline about new enzymes that will help break down plastic or PET faster than any other method used. And these are uh, microbial enzymes that are actually coming from microbes in trash heaps. And so from this, this source of problem, plastic in trash, a group of scientists found this group of bacteria that found a way of feeding on plastic to make their life possible. 
And from those bacteria, there are enzymes that break down plastic. And I think that the plastic pollution problem that we have is uh, immense to say the least. And I'm excited about the microbes that'll help us fix it. Well, yeah, I, I must have missed that story in my Twitter feed. That's really in incredible. Microbes that can help us with our plastic problem. Yeah, and I think if we want to just talk about what's the most timely, today there was a Nobel award given for the discovery of CRISPR technology. CRISPR technology are kind of like molecular scissors that let us edit genomes. And it's this rather remarkable biotechnology method that's being used to try and create crops that will survive disease or perhaps solve previous genetic problems. Just so many potential applications with this one bit of technology, uh, which is why it create, was um, awarded a Nobel. And it comes from microbes. But if you look in the headlines, it's sort of lost that that technology had a microbial origin. And so I think that so often there are remarkable things that we're excited about. We just don't know that they have a, a microbial history. Well, I, I'm going to do Marty's next question then because it's quite relevant to that same point. Uh, Marty writes, many on the stream today, people watching are environmental or science educators and communicators. How can we as a field help the public better understand the role of microbes in our lives? Again, great question. And I love the, the mission, right? Is to share these stories and this relevance. And so I think I'm gonna focus back in on that word in relevance. There are a million microbial discoveries to talk about and microbial applications. But we know as science communicators and educators that what really makes information sticky is often when it's relevant to us. And so the more stories I think we can all share about how these microbes are, are actually impacting our lives and the lives of the people we're communicating to can help build trust that, okay, indeed, discovering new microbes, discovering new microbe applications leads to this better future. I think that's why, uh, like, the scale that you provided is so important, right? Actually putting things into person size scale, because otherwise we can't see these things unless we grow them out on Petri dishes. And even then, that doesn't really get across what's happening or how important they could be to look at, you know, that little scientific implement. Yeah, I think you bring up a good point. So the challenge with microbiology is often this sort of same, oh no, we can't see it. It's not relevant. It's harder to teach because it's invisible. Um, but I, I wanna think about that because most of space we can't really see. And dinosaurs, we can't engage with. They existed on this planet before we were here. And yet when you talk to people about what they love about science, it's usually, oh my gosh, so excited for space travel. Wish I could live with the dinosaurs. These are the, the grand loves of most people when they're growing up and learning about science. Microbes are, are living with us now and we also can't see them, but that doesn't mean that they're any less remarkable than the exploration of space or any less powerful than the world's largest dinosaur. And we just have to help sort of share that story. That, that gets a round of applause. That was a great answer to that question. Okay, let me get some more for you. Uh, how are microbes related to cancer and cancer treatment? Ooh, meaty question. So <laughs> I'm going to say broadly, many different ways. So when we say microbes, remember we're talking about nearly a trillion species. They're going to have a lot of different relationships with anything we talk about. Um, I'm going to mention one really cool finding that I just read about the other day, which was a, a plant virus, which is being investigated by a group of researchers to see if it can trigger an immune reaction in humans. So this is not a virus that will cause any disease in us. It's for, um, it's a mosaic virus in pea flowers, if I'm not wrong, but it is enough to elicit an immune reaction. And so the idea is putting this virus somewhere in the body might start priming our own immune system to recognize tumor cells. And so this is a kind of unexpected way that microbes can help us potentially fight cancer. 
there are other relationships with microbes in cancer that are a little bit more nefarious. There's some research involving microbes in our gut and whether they might be producing compounds that increase our likelihood of cancer. And so much like the answer to any question what relates to microbes is that there are likely microbes that we're going to understand in the future are our foes and that might be targets for cancer therapy, while others are likely going to be our superhero partners in fighting cancer. All right, excellent stuff. So I'm thinking about the, um, the graphic that you had up the house and the compost and the soil and the garden. Uh, we talked before the show, there are so many other places in that diagram where there could be microbes. So you, like, I don't know, maybe you can pull it back up and we can dive into some of those, those others. We've got a few minutes left in the show here. So I think it would be, it'd be fun yeah. to do if we still can. Yeah, absolutely. So and folks, still drop your questions. Definitely. Uh, so I'll share a few along the way. Um, so there are microbes, as you mentioned, all around us doing remarkable things. And the list of choosing what microbes to talk about uh, is a daunting task to pull together. And so we're going to go back over to the different sort of places we can visit in our yard. Uh, and I'm going to not visit the bird yet. <laughs> but this is the one that I really want to talk about because it's really fun and I think slightly bizarre. So there are microbes that you can find associated with certain plants. Um, they can also be floating around sometimes in clouds. And in plants, they have the ability of forming ice crystals, even at warmer temperatures. And they do this because they have proteins in them that help sort of organize the molecules of water around them. And so this microbe has evolved this ability so that it can use ice crystals to sort of punch through the plants and kind of soak up all the goodness inside of those plant cells. But a company uses this same knowledge to take the proteins from this bacteria and make artificial snow at warmer temperatures. And so some places that you visit to go skiing actually use this snow max, this material derived from bacteria to help produce snow. And again, you can find this microbe no farther away than a plant and perhaps no farther away than creating some of your snowflakes in the atmosphere. Um, if you're like me, like walking around nature preserves and sometimes you get really sad because you see what looks like patches of oil. And sometimes they are indeed oil, but sometimes if you poke them, they sort of crack. And this is a sign that this isn't oil, but rather something like manganese or metals that are being liberated from metal oxidizing bacteria that are living at the bottom of these puddles. And so there are related microbes to this that are iron oxidizing bacteria that you can often see evidence of when you're looking at stagnant bodies of water that are sort of rusty colored at the bottom. And these microbes are very good at kind of pulling out iron molecules as they use the metals for energy. And they're so good at sort of pulling apart these metal ions that some miners in some mining operations in Chile use them to help extract iron from mixed ore. Um, and they're not looking for the iron, but rather the copper that's associated with that iron. And so it's thought that something like 10 to 15% of the copper that we use is coming in part from these microbes that are added to help pull apart the material. Oh, wow. I'm going to have to go touch some more ponds and see, and see what's going on. I never would have thought uh, seeing that shimmer, because I know that I've seen it and seen it in places where it shouldn't have been oil, that it's probably some of these cool microbes. Yeah. Fascinating. Oh my gosh. All right, I'm going to go hiking this afternoon. I'm going to go find a pond and look for some metal oxidizing bacteria. Fascinating stuff. Okay, let me see what's happening over here in the chat real quick. Okay, 
Jerry says, excellent and fluent moderate. Oh, like that was for me. I was so mesmerized by your presentation that I forgot to think about questions I may have wanted to ask. Thanks. So there you go. Kuna. Uh, let's see. Julie says, thank you for making this information so approachable. It was amazing to hear about everything we are surrounded by. Nice. Great talk. Thanks for making this fun and informative. Uh, let's see. Oh, and Doug has a question. If I wanted to buy an affordable microscope to see some of this, what specs should I look for? Any that thoughts? is a great question. Um, sorry, it sounds like a verbal crutch, but I actually think all of these are wonderful questions. If you go to the Microbe Institute and check out our fellows program, we're working with an artist and scientist who uses microscopy, mm -hmm. both in her science and in creating art. And her webpage actually highlights suggestions for affordable microscopes that people can buy at home and give some pointers to them. So I'm going to somewhat punt the question to a far better source. Sounds good. Sounds good. So Doug, go look for the Microbe Institute. Pop that into your search bar. <laughs> All the right. scientist well, in question is, is Tracy Devonport, and she's a, um, a really remarkable person. And so I recommend following her on Instagram as well, because she has gorgeous photography of this microbial world. Oh, okay, cool. I have to go look that up too. A lot, I'm gonna have to go look up lots of links myself after this presentation, if you know so cool, so much cool stuff. So I did, everybody watching, I did put links to the Community of Microbes app that Dr. Madden talked Thank about you. in the chat uh, and to the Wild Sourdough Project, which the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences is part of as well. So go check those things out too. Uh, Dr. Madden, if people wanted to keep in touch with you and follow your work, how do they how do they do that? Yeah, I can be found on Instagram or Twitter at Ann A. Madden, um, or I mean, my email is available on the internet. So if you've got a question or feedback, please send me a note. I'm always happy to hear it. Excellent stuff. Thank you so much for being with us for lunchtime discovery today. Thank you so much. It's been a treat. Everybody, I'll remind you, you can learn more about the Lunchtime Discovery Series and see what programs are coming up by following the Office of Environmental Education on Twitter. They're at North Carolina EE. You can also find the office's website at the Department of Environmental Equality, and there you can see resources and the schedule of events upcoming. We're here every Wednesday at noon with new guest speakers and new topics just for you. So I hope that we'll see you again real soon. You can also follow the Museum of Natural Sciences on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. On all three, we're at Natural Sciences. And don't forget to visit naturalsciences.org. Check out the virtual events page where you can see links and information about all of the great stuff happening at the museum. We are back open to the public now. So get your free time ticket and come and see us inside the museum. We have new hours of operation and protocols in place to keep everybody safe. And you never know, you might see me with my face covering on sitting at the front desk, waving as you come in the door. So hope that we'll see you all again very soon. If not in person at the museum, then right back here next Wednesday for lunchtime discovery. Take care, everybody. Stay safe. And we'll see you again next time. Bye.